This is the second part in the series. We're going to find the fingerprints of God in the origin of the stars, how the planets formed, and where the elements came from in our universe. Now there are a number of things that have to happen to make stars and the 94 essential elements. The first step is looking at the first generation stars coming out of uh, singularity and as the universe expands they get bigger and bigger. The gas, both hydrogen and helium gas, extend out. They accumulate because of gravity and they continue, they're giant in size, and they continue to generate energy by this nuclear fusion of molecules of hydrogen into helium. Now we've said previously that the first element formed was hydrogen. After you've created protons and neutrons, you have an element of hydrogen. But that element of hydrogen is unhappy all by itself. It's unstable. So it has two choices. One, it can take two of them, and that's what ends up as being hydrogen gas. Or what can happen is you can have the hydrogen and adds one neutron and then doubles that. The two of them come together that makes them happy and they become helium gas. What's important about this is this fusion, nuclear fusion, of the two hydrogen molecules with a couple of neutrons is that results in production of a huge amount of energy which create the heat and light that are associated with stars. And what happens is the hydrogen and helium are, as the universe expands, remember it's an expanding universe, it pulls the gases along with them and as it does, gravity draws the particles together and pretty soon you have massive stars, first generation stars, galaxies and nebula, all created by gravity from this process of making taking hydrogen and a couple of neutrons, fusing together, make the helium, and that energy that we see is the heat and light, especially the light looking up in the sky. All of this is burning hydrogen, fu a nuclear fusion of hydrogen molecules plus a couple of neutrons to make the, all the stars shine. That's how we see them. Now, this is important. The scientists have proved mathematically that in any expanding universe, any expanding universe, including ours, especially like ours, must have a beginning. So mathematically, it can't have existed forever. This is called the BBG theorem. Our universe, therefore, has not existed for an infinite amount of time, but rather is estimated to be 13.8 billion years old. Our universe had a birthday. Now the second event is that of the gaseous first generational scars. They can run out of energy by, uh, they lose the amount of hydrogen they have, and therefore they can't do the nuclear fusion to produce the energy necessary to stay bright and alive. So they start to collapse and gravity forces them to collapse into what either is called a black hole. It's such a, a dense compacted core that it sucks in all of the light or they explode as supernovas. Now the next step is going to be the exploding supernovas have such heat that they fuse hydrogen and helium, possibly oxygen, and they make 94 essential elements and blast them into space as stardust. So we're going to ultimately when we make our planet Earth we're going to need 94 essential elements but that's billions of years later. So this is done all in preparation for making secondary generation stars which will use some of these up to 26 of them but all the rest of them are put into Earth for us. Now when we're looking at the seven major creative events we're going to look at the supernova's elementary stardust. So the supernova make the 94 elements and blast them out of stardust. The nifty nebula come along and they grab all the stardust with all the 94 essential elements and make secondary generation stars just like the sun. They'll also make the planets that surround stars like the sun, which is Earth. This is an important slide because it shows you an important transition we make the first generation giant stars and they're just filled with gas but they have a core that's more dense now it, as long as you're making taking hydrogen making helium they have lots of energy and they have lots of light but as they lose that hydrogen they start getting they start running out of energy and they start collapsing and the center part becomes denser and more dense and more dense until one of two things happen one it can go make a black hole it's it's so dense it just pulls light in with it so you can't see it or it explodes and that's what's called a supernova 
And because the supernova is so hot and so intense, it takes the hydrogen, helium, and oxygen, and it fuses them together to make 94 essential elements. Now, why? It's interesting because the only people, the only reason to get 94 elements is to put them into our Earth for us. When they make a second generation star, they'll use up to 26, and that's done in the nebula. So here comes the stardust, and it's collected by the nebula. And these are star formers. So in the center, it makes a second generation star, and it has a magnetizable center core of iron, which is going to be important later for magnetizing the Earth. We'll talk about that. And it'll take in the round it is the disk, protoplanetary disk, and that's where all of the essential elements are made, and that's where the planets are made. And it just happens that our planet got all 94 essential elements because they are essential. Now you realize this is all being done billions of years before the Earth is even formed. So it's like anticipated. In other words, this whole process anticipates the develop the development and formation of the Earth and life. This is a relatively recent scientific discovery is they found the presence of oxygen when they look at the, the contents of the stars. In the pulsars up the middle there is oxygen so when it makes elements it's going to make it out of hydrogen and helium and oxygen fusing together to make the 94 essential elements. So you might ask this question. Hey are we made up of more stuff than hydrogen gas and where does everything come from? Well, the answer is yes. All of the essential elements we need for life on Earth are made in the giant stars as they collapse into supernovas, which we just talked about. The supernova has extreme heat, makes the 94 essential elements, and then blasts them out in the space of stardust. And this is what happens. You take all these elements, you stick them together, and they become larger and larger. They're all atoms, but they get bigger and bigger in terms of size. So hydrogen is the smallest. You can see as you go up here, here comes iron at 26 and you have all of the others going up the up the line up to the 94 and then of course they with nuclear cyclotrons they've been able to make additional ones but these aren't natural they're not in natural life now going along with this once you have the elements you also have to create the laws and the constants associated with chemistry just like the physical laws when you look at the all the laws and you look at all the constants, they, all of them are very, very large numbers. And they cannot be off even one digit at the billionth of a degree or the whole process doesn't work. This is absolutely a creative event. You can't even imagine creating all these laws and constants in both physics and chemistry and have them be this size and then have them all occur randomly. That's just too much to ask. Therefore, it's... It is unreasonable to assume they just randomly appeared. The only reasonable conclusion is that they were created. So if they're created, then there has to be a creator with infinite wisdom. Here's another mystery alert. The electrons circulate around the nucleus for all of the elements, but they don't just they're not just random. They're actually put in various shells, and the shells have very distinct energy levels. They get the higher and higher energy as you go out. Uh, from the number of shells and the number of electrons depends on the number of protons. Remember we went up to 94 so there's 94 protons and 94 electrons and the rest of the uh, of the weight of that molecule is because of added neutrons. But they're, they're charge neutral. Now this is, this is actually quite amazing because we the modern science has used this and I've used it in my work as a neuroradiologist. And what we can do is by putting electric current going through wire around a patient and you can make these energy levels you can take electrons in one level and you bump it up to the other it doesn't like it but you can push it up there and but when it comes back what it does is gives off radio waves and we can use those this is called the Larmor precessional frequency it's just the right frequency to make that electron jump and this is what it looks like it's really pretty cool. This is here's your spine, here's your head on from the front, and here's your head from the side. And all we've done is made those electrons in this in the tissue jump. We give them energy and we make them jump a, a different shell. And when they come back, they give off radio waves, and we can tell where the radio waves came from and plot it all out. And so just moving those electrons, I can give you a picture of your 
spine, your head, and everything else in your body, right down to little details of arteries and veins and little white matter tracks, everything. It's just astounding to me. Now, as we mentioned, we have laws and constants in chemistry. And here's just a list of all the laws and the many, many constants. These are numbers that reflect how these laws work. And they're very specific and they're very long. And you, you just can't imagine that all of them occurred just by random. They have to have been created. And this hit requires a creator with infinite wisdom. That's the really only reasonable conclusion looking at the data. Now, as we said before and explained previously, the Nifty Nebula are the secondary generation star formers and they use their, they include all the elements and they make planets. So it starts as a supernova and this is what they look like from the top and the nebula looks like this and we said it has a center part and a peripheral part, we'll call the protoplanetary disk. Now, you might ask a question, hey, I know second genera generation stars, they're like the sun. They're formed in the nebula and they can make all the elements, they include all the elements up to iron in the, in the stars, but the planets form from the stardust. And they can pick up all the 94, at least our planet picked up all the 94 from our specific nebula. It's not clear whether any of the other planets in any other nebula and in the other galaxies have done the same thing. We just don't know, but we know it's happened to us. Now, when we talked about second generation stars, we mentioned that they only have 26 out of the 94 essential elements. And the reason is that to make these, all of these up to this iron, when you fuse, you have nuclear fusion of various kinds of hydrogen, helium, and oxygen, to make these numbers, it all gives off tremendous heat and light. And that's what makes the outer surface be, appear to be on fire. In fact, it is. It's all molten. But beyond that, it takes energy to make them. So the sun doesn't get that. So the sun only gets the 26. But it fortunately gets the iron, which makes an iron core. And we need that because that causes the sun to be magnetized, which is going to make the earth magnetized because we have an iron core. And that helps to protect the planet from asteroids by having a magnetic field around it. It's just truly a, a remarkable event. Now we'll look at a, a nebula up close. It is a disk, potentially planets going around it. Now it just happens our sun was made in our nebula. And from our disk, we got all the planets in our little solar system. And then we have the Earth. Somewhere in here is the Earth. But also you have asteroids and a bunch of other stuff that happens to get formed. But they're all stuck in the same planetary disk. And they're all going to be held by gravity to the center secondary star, which we call the sun. It's just remarkable that all of this happens for sure in our Earth, in our sun. And they can see millions of these stars and planets in relationship. But none of them seem to have all the elements and they don't have a similar atmosphere. Only ours, as near as we can tell, is set up for life, your life and my life. That is truly a miracle. Now, here's even a more amazing miracle alert. Uh, you, you can't even make this up. When our sun is created and our planet, of course we're here and the other planets are elsewhere, but our planet is precisely positioned precisely positioned so as not too close to get too hot or too far to get too cold. To support life, our, you, our Earth, our Earth is positioned exactly at the right distance, which we call the habitable zone. This is truly a miracle alert. alert. Uh, almost qualifies for a creative event, but it, we're going to just leave it as a miracle alert. Now, we do know that there's over one million stars that they can identify with secondary stars that have planets at the same distance of the Earth, but none of them have evidence of an atmosphere that supports life. We seem to be the only one. You think that's coincidence? I think not. Now, Earth was developed and became a reality 4.6 billion years ago. So from 13.8 down to 4.6, there was no Earth. There was no, our nebula and our supernova wasn't working. But at this point it is, and it created our planet. It starts as a, molt, a molten ball and gradually cool. Later it will be hit by this asteroid, and we'll talk about that in a minute. 
the Earth's crust had to form, and formed land, and then separated it from the seas. It distributed all 94 elements, mainly in the Earth's crust, but extending downward as well. And depending on how heavy they are, the heavier ones went to the center, which is important. But at the same time, the Earth had to create all the laws of nature and the biochemical bonds necessary for to have life, because that is starting now. And who, who could have done that? Well, the most likely is a creative event by a creator. Now, the next step is absolutely astounding. It, it, it should qualify as a creative event, but it's not quite to that level. We'll just leave it as a miracle alert. The Earth was formed 4.6 billion years ago. So from 13.8 billion years down to 4.6, we have that gap before the Earth was formed. But it was a little short of carbon and water. And what happened? About 100 million years after it was formed, which is about 4 billion years, or 4.5, it got hit by a large asteroid that was one-third the size of the Earth. So a huge asteroid hit it, and this asteroid happened to, happened to contain carbon and ice as water. And it hits the outer surface, and there we add all the extra water and all the carbon we need to have life and to have oceans and enough water everywhere. At the same time this happened, we formed the moon. It, because of the uh, collision, it knocked off a piece and it became our moon. You have to ask yourself, <laughs> can this be coincidence? It couldn't have happened without, it, we would not have life if it didn't happen. Is this coincidence or is this by design? Um, I know what my choice is. It, this is just too much to be a random event. The way the Earth developed was in layers. So it has a dense core in the middle of iron. It has a molten level or layer around it, which is heated by nuclear fission of uranium in here, which keeps the center part of the Earth warm. Then there's this mantle. Now, the mantle is mostly rock. And at the upper portion of the mantle is kind of a slippery layer. It's called the asthenosphere. It's very, very slippery. And it is abuts the continental and ocean oceanic crust. So this is parts under the ocean, and this is the very crust where you see uh, most of the Earth with uh, in the very, very top is the uh, is the topsoil. The lakes are in here, but underneath the lakes is this crust. Now, the trouble is these work together, and it slips over this, and what it creates, the squishy layer is like molten tar, and the Earth, the surface of it, slips, and these are called tectonic plates. And so the Earth, the solid part of the Earth, initially is going to begin with one block of land, and it will break up over time to make the continents as we know today. So this is slipping, slippage caused by these tectonic plates, and that's where it happens, right at this junction. On the last slide, we really focus on the slippage of the land masses at the junction of the upper mantle and the crust. And this, this slippage allows along, along this line creates the tectonic plates, which over time have gone from one big block of land to all the continents we have today. But now on this slide, we want to focus on the center portion. Here's the iron core. The iron core is important because it's magnetized by the sun, and therefore creates a magnetic field around it, which helps avoid getting hit by too many asteroids. Now next to it is a molten layer, which is undergoes nuclear fission, as we mentioned, with uranium is the primary user, and this creates immense amount of heat. Now this heat heats the center of the Earth, and the sun heats the top of the Earth, and that keeps the temperature of the Earth in a habitable temperature. So we're at a habitable distance, and we're at a habitable tem uh, temperature for most of the planet, except the polar areas, and it's a little cold. In between is the solid stone mantle, and of course the other portions we talked about earlier. This is what it looks like. These now we're looking the, the Earth crust, the continental crust, and the uh, suboceanic crust are all underneath the water and underneath and underneath the land masses. And originally they were all stuck together. And this is thing a, at this time that the land masses were called Pangaea. And this took years and years to start to separate. And these are the tectonic plates, and we are still mo they're still moving today. And they when they move and they bump into each other, we get the the tidal waves and the tsunamis caused by this contraction and the earth we start getting earthquakes. Now just a word about the Earth's crust. If you look at a cliff any place, you can see the topsoil is very, very thin. That's the part where 
we're using that's the dirt where we grow things underneath that you get rock the densest rock is in the is in the deep portions that's granite and the, the upper rock tends to be more sandstone the lightest rock is a volcanic rock and that gets jetted out by the volcanoes which we talked about in earlier lectures so this very thin topsoil is where we have to support all the plant life the total earth crust is about five to six miles so you're going to go down five to six miles and then you're going to hit the hard mantle now this is of interest because everybody likes volcanoes and are curious about them. And they start as a hot spot next to the nuclear, the molten layer at the bottom. It just sends heat through here enough to melt things. As it does, this molten rock gets molten, comes up to the surface, then blows out the top, taking a whole lot of this material. That's, of course, it's all molten. It's, it was hard, hard as rock and now it's molten because of this center core heat. And we see it then as it bursts out, it comes out with fire and lava flow. And the lava flow creates this material that goes over the surface of the earth, which is really the lightest material and is, it mixes in with the soil and it's very useful for plants. Now here's a summary of what science has actually revealed about the universe. It's a physical system. It does not have an infinite past. It has a birthday, which is 13.8 billion years ago, which is calculated from looking at the evolution of electromagnetic w waves and their appearance in the, the depths of space and by mathematical calculation the VVG theorem and that puts it at 3.8 billion years. Nuclear fusion from hydrogen into helium provides most of the heat and light for the first generation stars which is why they can see them. But then these first generation stars lose energy, some of them, and they implode and then they, some of them make a black hole, but some explode, making supernova with tremendous force, which in that very high heat and, uh, and the compression, all the 94 essential elements are created. And they're blasted out in space as stardust. Now the nebulae come along and they capture all the stardust, and they are a disk, and they make a second generation star and the planets associated with that star. The center part of the nebula makes the, the star, and then what goes with it? The planets are made from the periphery, the protoplanetary disk. These are second generation stars, and the center have elements up to iron, but not beyond. The planets, on the other hand, are formed around the stars, and at least our planet received all 94 essential elements. We need these on Earth, and I don't know if any other nebula but ours or any other planet was formed that got the 94 elements in all of space as if we were the only shop in town. Now we've seen what science has identified and investigated, but there's still gaps. Science has not revealed about the universe. These include the zero point energy that fills up all of the apparent absence, of, you know, the, the void in space is not, it's not a vacuum, it's got actually radiomagnetic energy. So it, the entire universe is part of a physical system that has physical characteristics. Then we know the, the universe is expanding because of something called dark energy, which nobody knows what that is. But the universe is expanding. The next we'll look at how Earth and planets like the Earth formed, it were formed in the stardust around the nebulae. How could they get all the essential elements, 1 to 94? Well, other stars can't or don't get these things. It seems like it's only Earth. Since the stars don't really need these elements when they're created, why were they produced when they were? They won't possibly be needed for another billion years or more. So then how did the Earth get po be positioned? So it's not random. We are exactly at the precise distance called a habitable distance from the Sun. Not too close, not too far. That clearly is a creative event. That can't be random. And then finally, we know now that we needed more carbon and water, and it just happened to be delivered somewhere around 4.5, about 100,000 years after the Earth was created. An asteroid made of carbon water just happened to hit our, our planet Earth, <laughs> delivering what exactly we needed to support life. Now, if you think that's just coincidence, it's just too much for me. So I think it's far more reasonable and more probable that these mysteries are resolved by the presence of a transphysical, supernatural, creative force we call God. This has to be created. This cannot be just coincidence. Here's the main takeaway. You have to believe, if you start looking at the Earth, at the universe, and the night sky, all you can think about are 
all the God's fingerprints. They're everywhere. In the next module, we'll look at development of life on Earth.